at precisely 7.42 on the chilly morning of March 14, 1941, Beatrice Tilly Schilling stood alone on the tarmac at RAF Kenley, her eyes fixed on a single hurricane warming up for what might be its pilot's final mission. At 32 years old, she had spent six long years at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, six years of relentless work and six years of unanswered questions. Now, standing in the crisp wind of a fighter station under siege, she watched a man prepare to gamble his life once again on an engine that might betray him. The problem had haunted her for months, brutal in its simplicity and deadly in its consequences. That week alone, the Luftwaffe had sent 43 Messerschmitt BF-109s across the English Channel. RAF pilots responded with courage and fury, engaging in 27 dogfights, but at the end of it, 14 Hurricanes and 9 Spitfires had been lost. The pattern never changed. A British pilot would spot the enemy, push his aircraft into a dive to attack, and suddenly the engine would cut out. The German fighter would either escape or worse, circle back and turn the stalled aircraft into a coffin. The root cause was well known. Schilling had read the combat reports, dissected maintenance logs, and spoken with the haunted survivors. The Merlin engine's carburetor flooded during negative G maneuvers. When the aircraft dove, gravity reversed, fuel surged upward in the float chamber, and the engine starved. For 1.5 deadly seconds, the fighter became powerless. And in air combat, 1.5 seconds was long enough for a German ace to close in and fire. British aircraft used float-type carburetors. German BF-19s, by contrast, had Daimler-Benz engines with direct fuel injection. They could dive, roll, climb, invert, without a flicker of power loss. That one advantage gave the Luftwaffe the edge in every encounter. The RAF was hemorrhaging experienced pilots, and the pressure to solve the carburetor problem grew with each telegram of condolence. For 11 months, Schilling chased an answer. Rolls-Royce had begun designing a pressure carburetor, an elegant, comprehensive solution. But it wouldn't be ready until 1943, maybe later. Meanwhile, fresh-faced boys climbed into hurricanes and spitfires every morning, knowing their engines could kill them before the Germans even got the chance. That morning, Schilling wasn't just an observer. Inside her leather satchel was a small brass washer, simple, precise, and revolutionary. Her team had tested it on bench engines for weeks. It worked, but bench tests weren't combat. Combat was velocity, gravity, panic, and life-or-death decisions measured in heartbeats. She needed real proof. The issue dated back to mid-1940, when the RAF upgraded to 100-octane fuel, increasing the Merlin engine's power. The Spitfire Mark II could now reach 370 miles per hour in level flight. But that extra power came at a cost. The Skinner's Union carburetor hadn't been designed to handle negative G-forces that came with high-speed dives. As principal technical officer in charge of carburetor research and development, Schilling understood the engine's limitations better than anyone. She'd been tearing apart engines since she was a teenager. At 14, she bought her first motorcycle and rebuilt the engine bolt by bolt. At 25, she raced that bike at Brooklands, achieving speeds over 106 miles per hour fast enough to earn the coveted British Motorcycle Racing Club Gold Star. A rare feat for anyone, rarer still for a woman. She was one of only three women to receive it. Her mastery of engines and her feel for their behavior under stress gave her an unmatched edge in understanding what pilots faced in combat. In January, inspiration struck. The problem wasn't the carburetor, it was gravity. Fuel surged the wrong way because nothing stopped it. So what if they restricted the flow? Not enough to starve the engine, 
just enough to prevent flooding during inverted or diving flight. She machined a brass disc with a small, precise hole, 0.04 inches in the center. It had taken 17 prototypes to get it right. The washer limited fuel flow during dives, preventing the surge that choked the engine. Now, standing beside the hurricane that squadron leader Davies would soon fly, she carried six of these brass restrictors and a desperate plan. Davies had already suffered two engine failures during dives. He didn't know the woman watching him wasn't a secretary, as he probably assumed, but the engineer who just might save his life. RAF regulations forbade unauthorized modifications. If her restrictor failed and a pilot died, she could face a court-martial, or worse. But Schilling didn't ask for permission. She had a plan and a partner, Sergeant William Cooper, a ground crew mechanic who owed her a favor. He'd worked on Merlin engines for years. When she showed him the brass washer, he nodded and got to work. The modification took less than a minute. Disconnect the fuel line, insert the washer, weld it in place, invisible unless you knew where to look. Twenty minutes later, Davies took off with the restrictor inside his aircraft, unaware of the quiet gamble that had just been made on his behalf. Schilling and Cooper watched from the tarmac, saying nothing as the hurricanes climbed into formation and banked south toward the channel. She waited, binoculars in hand, calculating fuel flow in her head, praying the math would hold at 400 miles per hour. An hour passed with no word. Radio silence could mean anything, no contact or the worst. Then, finally, word crackled through. Three hurricanes inbound. All three returned safely. Schilling rushed toward Davies as he landed. He looked different, smiling, not haunted. When Cooper asked if there were any engine issues, Davies grinned. Best the Merlin's ever run, he said. He dove on two Messerschmitts over Dungeness. The engine never faltered. Schilling explained the modification. Davies listened, then turned to Cooper. Put that thing in every hurricane on this station. She protested. It wasn't authorized. Davies didn't care. He'd buried too many friends. If the brass wanted to court-martial him, they could do it after the war. That afternoon, four more hurricanes were modified. Over the next three days, five aircraft flew with the restrictor. Twelve diving attacks. Zero engine failures. Word spread like wildfire. By March 18th, squadron commanders across 11 Group demanded the restrictor. Schilling received 14 calls in two days. Everyone wanted it now, but scaling up production from six handmade washers required approval. Within four days, the Air Ministry granted it. Rolls-Royce received the contract. They could produce 500 restrictors per week. Schilling formed a five-person team and hit the road on her motorcycle, the same Norton she'd raced in her youth. She traveled base to base, training crews, supervising installations, checking welds, rejecting any component that failed her high standards. Biggin Hill, Hornchurch, North Weald, everywhere she went, the results were the same. Pilots returned smiling, engines ran flawlessly. The brass washer, now cheekily dubbed Miss Schilling's Orifice by the pilots, had become a talisman. The nickname, crude, irreverent, didn't bother her. She understood military humor and the relief behind it. If it helped pilots remember the solution, so be it. By April, every fighter station wanted the restrictor. Some pilots refused to fly without it. Luftwaffe after-action reports noted a sudden shift. British fighters no longer broke off dives. The edge was gone. By mid-April, Schilling's restrictor had been installed in over 2,000 Merlin engines. It became standard. New aircraft rolled off the production lines with it pre-installed. Though Rolls-Royce continued developing a pressure carburetor, many questioned whether it was even necessary. 
but Schilling knew the restrictor was a brilliant stopgap, not a permanent solution. True engineering meant designing systems that eliminated the flaw entirely, not merely bypassing it. Still, the impact was immediate. In March, before the restrictor, engine failures occurred in 38% of diving attacks. In April, the number dropped to 0.4%. Losses fell. Kills rose. Morale soared. Pilots like Robert Stanford Tuck, who had once hesitated in dives, now pressed the attack. The restrictor didn't just save engines, it saved lives. It soon expanded beyond fighter command. Coastal command, bomber command, even the fleet air arm requested it. Rolls-Royce ramped up production to 1,000 units per week. The restrictor remained in use well into 1943. When the pressure carburetor was finally introduced, the transition was slow. Removing the old system took time, and aircraft couldn't be spared. Many planes kept their restrictors until war's end. Schilling, meanwhile, turned her attention to new problems. Engines freezing in the Russian winter. Fuel mixture issues at high altitude. Supercharger efficiency. Her expertise extended far beyond a brass washer. She developed cold start procedures for Spitfires in Murmansk, adjusted carburetors for high-altitude operations, and improved systems that allowed engines to function at minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. She even helped design a bobsled for the RAF Olympic team, a strange project, but one perfectly suited for her knowledge of aerodynamics and friction. Throughout it all, she remained an engineer at heart. Even when her husband, George Naylor, returned from flying 31 bomber missions over Germany, they never discussed their wartime work. That was their unspoken pact. Home was home. Work was war. She raced her motorcycle in retirement, maintained the Norton she'd ridden since 1934, and quietly kept solving problems until the day she died in 1990, aged 81. Today, pubs and museums bear her name. Universities teach her restrictor as a model of wartime innovation. Simple, elegant, immediate. Everything good engineering should be. And somewhere, encased in glass, sits a tiny brass washer that once changed the course of a war. Not with fire or fury, but with brilliance. And with that, Beatrice Schilling earned her place not just in engineering history, but in the story of victory itself.